This is one of those stories that reminds you just how dangerous the open ocean really is. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. If that's of interest to you, the next time you're over the like button's house, sneak upstairs and steal all of their left socks and then also unplug their Wi-Fi. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. On July 20th, 1968, a small fishing boat called El Fausto took off from their port on La Palma Island, which is part of the Canary Islands, which is a Spanish archipelago, and they took off for El Hierro, which was another island about 50 miles to the south. On board El Fausto were three very experienced fishermen and sailors. They were the brothers Ramon and Eliberto Hernandez, as well as their cousin Miguel Acosta. Their trip to El Hierro was uneventful. It took about seven hours. They arrived at the port in the early evening hours and they unloaded their cargo onto the island, which was actually explosives used in agriculture. So they unloaded all that and then the three of them went to get some food and relax for a few minutes before they came back to the dock and began preparing to leave. So that evening, as the three men are standing on their boat, repacking the ship and getting ready to leave in the next few minutes, they see this man running down the dock who's frantically waving at them, trying to get their attention. And so they stop what they're doing and they beckon him over and say, you know, what, what do you need? And the man introduced himself as Julio Garcia. He was clearly very upset. He was talking really quickly and they had to slow him down a couple times to try to understand what he was saying but he communicated that his wife had called him earlier that day and she said their two-year-old daughter was very sick and he needed to come home right away. And he ran down to catch the ferry back to his home island of La Palma, so the same island these three men are from, and he missed the ferry. And the next ferry going back to his home island was not for another two days. And so Julio was running up and down the dock trying to flag anybody who owned a ship that might be willing to take him to La Palma. Even if it was out of the way, he was prepared to pay for it. And so of course the El Fausto crew said, we're actually going to La Palma. We live there too, and we'd be happy to take you. You don't need to pay for this. And so Julio begins to help them load the rest of their equipment onto the boat, which included some food. They had 22 pounds of fruit and they had some fresh water. And then once everything was loaded up, they undid their lines and they set sail for La Palma. They took off at about 2.30 in the morning on July 21st. The water was very calm during their return trip. The only thing they had to contend with was a light mist that formed over the water in the early morning hours right after the sun came up, but it really wasn't enough to affect their ability to navigate. But even if the mist was more severe than people realized, Ramon, Eliberto, and Miguel were very experienced sailors that in fact had been sailing on this particular stretch of water ever since they were teenagers, and they had navigated these waters in far worse conditions and had always managed to get through it. But at 10 a.m. that morning when the Fausto crew was supposed to arrive at La Palma, they didn't. And the owner of the boat itself was waiting at the dock for them. And when they didn't show up, he wasn't overly concerned because he knew these three men. He regularly went out on this particular boat with them. In fact, he normally would have gone on the trip to El Hierro with them, but he had commitments on La Palma, so he didn't go. And so he's not particularly worried about them. He figures they ran into some mechanical issue and you know they're getting it figured out, but they're just late. But after a little while, the families of the El Fausto crew started to ask the owner, you know, where are they? Why aren't they here? And so the owner, who again is not overly concerned, but wants to make sure the families are not worrying, says, you know what, I'll send a, a search boat that will take the exact route El Fausto was on, but in reverse, and I'm sure they can just drive straight out there and they'll run into them and they will help them fix, you know, whatever issue they have, which is more than likely mechanical. That's an old boat and we've certainly run into other mechanical issues in the past. So this search boat goes out and for hours and hours and hours, they're looking along the exact same charted course that El Fausto was supposed to be on and they're nowhere to be found. And so they radio back in to the owner of the boat and they say, look, we can't find him, what do you want us to do? And he called them back in and he realized that, you know what, if we can't find them anywhere near the route, that probably something more sinister has happened to them. And it was at this point that he got in touch with authorities and they launched a much more formal search and rescue effort. Planes and boats spilled out over the sea to look for El Fausto and her crew and everybody who was looking was operating with an enormous sense of urgency because anybody who was looking had been told 
These guys don't have much in the way of supplies. They have 22 pounds of fruit and they have a very limited freshwater supply. And so if we don't find them within a couple of days, there's a very good chance that we're gonna find four corpses. But despite searchers' motivation to find these guys, a couple of days passed and there was no sign of them. And unfortunately, people did start to think, I think it's more likely we're gonna find four dead bodies than four sailors waiting to be rescued. But on July 25th, four days after El Fausto left El Hierro on their way to La Palma and then of course got lost, four days after that, a British ship called Duquesa radioed in an incredible message. They said they had found this fishing boat that was drifting along and there was four people standing on the deck and they were waving flashlights around to try to get their attention. And as this British ship moved up closer to the fishing boat, they were able to read on the hull the call sign of the boat and it was, of course, El Fausto. Where El Fausto had been found was 120 miles west of La Palma. So they had drifted way, way off course. But once they pulled up alongside of them, they could see that not only were the four crew members alive, they actually seemed like they were in pretty good spirits. They certainly were dehydrated and were very thankful to get some water and they were starving and they were obviously pretty freaked out because they had just been adrift in the middle of the ocean and probably were realizing that this could end really badly for us. But beyond all that, they seemed okay. And very quickly that message was passed to friends and family of the El Fausto crew back on La Palma, who's waiting anxiously to hear any news about their loved ones. And when they were told they had been found and they were alive, they were overjoyed because they thought they were dead. But after the initial transmission had been sent out by Duquesa saying, hey, we found the crew and they're alive and they're good. Well, a couple hours went by and the Duquesa sent another transmission that was very strange. They said the crew of El Fausto was refusing to be towed back home. They were saying that our boat's just fine. You know, we're good. We just, we just need a couple of supplies and, and we'll be on our way. And so the captain of Duquesa says to the men, then why are you out here? How did you get 120 miles west of La Palma? Something had to have gone wrong with your boat. So, so what happened? But the men didn't really answer his question. They just said, oh no, there's nothing wrong with our boat. Uh, there's no mechanical issues. Everything's fine. You know, we, we, we appreciate your offer, but we just need a couple of supplies and, and we'll be on our way. Even Julio, who had made this special effort to get home to his sick daughter and to see his wife, even he is saying, no, we don't need a tow, we're good. And so the captain of the Duquesa is looking at these guys thinking, what am I missing here? You just drifted 120 miles away. You probably should have died. You're very lucky that we happened to find you in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. You know, had we not found you, you probably would have died of dehydration in the next couple of days. And so we found you, we're offering to bring you to shore to guarantee that you will get to see your sick daughter and to see your wife and for you all to see your families and your friends. And you're telling us to leave and you're telling us that there's nothing wrong with your boat when clearly something happened. But the captain of the Duquesa could not convince them to get towed in. They were totally not gonna do it. And apparently they were very polite about it. They, they said, look, we really appreciate the offer, but really our boat is just fine. We just need some, some food, water, cigarettes, and some fuel, and, and we'll be good. And so ultimately the crew of the Duquesa obliged their request and they gave them 18 hours worth of fuel along with a whole bunch of cigarettes and water and food. And they watched as the four men sailed east towards La Palma and they were waving the whole time, everything seemed fine. And then they vanished over the horizon. And the captain of Duquesa would call in over the radio that based on where they were and how close they were to La Palma, they should expect to see them arriving at port at about 7 p.m. that night. Back on La Palma, friends, family, and hundreds of other people from the island went down to the dock and were drinking wine and having a big party, celebrating the imminent return of their friends and their loved ones. But unfortunately, 7 p.m. came and went and they didn't show up. And so of course, the family of the crew became very worried that, oh my gosh, this, this nightmare is starting all over again. And the owner of El Fausto came over to them and reassured them that he's been in touch with the authorities who were speaking to the captain of the Duquesa, who were speaking to our friends and, and family and loved ones on El Fausto, and everything's fine. They have all the supplies they need. They have all the fuel they need. I'm sure they're just running a little bit late. Everything is totally fine. And so friends and family and some diehard supporters stayed down at the dock for several more hours until it became clear that something's gone wrong. And unfortunately, this nightmare is not over. 
The next morning after El Fausto and her crew were once again labeled missing, Spain kicked off their largest ever search for missing people. They had bombers flying overhead. They had military and civilian ships all over the area where the Duquesa had made contact with El Fausto. They had so many people combing the water, so many planes overhead. And for two weeks, they looked everywhere and they couldn't find anything. And finally, they had to call it off. And they said, look, we don't know what happened to them. And they declared them lost at sea, which basically meant we think they're dead, but we'll probably never know for sure. Two months later, on October 9th, an Italian merchant ship called the Ana de Mayo, who was on their way to Venezuela, spotted a small fishing boat way off in the distance that was just bobbing around aimlessly. And the first thing they noticed was, this ship is far too small to be making a cross oceanic voyage. They shouldn't be out here. And as they got closer, they could tell that there was no one standing on deck or in the cabin. There's no one driving this boat. And so finally they got so close they could read the hull and it says El Fausto. So the Ana de Mayo pulls up right alongside El Fausto. They tether themselves together so it doesn't float away. And two of the Italian sailors get on board El Fausto and they're yelling out to see if anybody's there, but you know, no one's responding and they're looking around and the ship is in great condition. There's, there's no sign of obvious damage or any violence that might've taken place on here. They go into the cabin where the steering wheel is and they're looking for some sort of logbook that would have documented, you know, what happened on the ship, but there's no logbook. And so the Italians were left scratching their head thinking, how could a perfectly seaworthy boat wind up abandoned in the middle of the Atlantic ocean? Where's their crew? But they still needed to go down below into the little space that was the engine room. And so the two sailors that had boarded to look around, they make their way over to the section of the deck where there's this hatch that they open up and they look down and they smell this horrible smell and they turn on their light and they're met with this horrible and inexplicable scene. Laying on the ground inside of the engine room on his back was a dead man who was partially mummified. He had no clothes on and he was clutching a transistor radio. And so the two Italians that found him, they stepped back and they had to compose themselves. And then one of them actually went down to look around for clues and see if perhaps there's other bodies down there. And so when he went down, it was just the one body and he could only find one other clue. And it was this small notebook that was positioned right behind the dead body that they didn't see when they first looked down. So the Italian sailors leave the engine room and they take the notebook back to their ship and they open it up. And the first thing they see is the middle section of the notebook has been torn out. In fact, 28 pages were missing. And all they were left with was a couple of pages at the beginning and a single page at the end. The first couple of pages just were a couple of notes and some simple math calculations, nothing significant. The last page appeared to be a farewell of sorts, but the language that was used was a little bit confusing and it was difficult to read. And so the Italians were not entirely sure what any of it actually meant. And so they figured it would be best to just give the notebook to authorities and they could figure out what it meant. And so the captain of the Ana de Mayo radios in to Spanish authorities that they found El Fausto and that they intend to tow it back to Venezuela where they were already going, at which point they'll turn over everything they found and authorities can take it from there. So the Italians put a tow line on the bow of El Fausto and began towing. Two days later, Spanish authorities receive a crushing telegram. Apparently the night before as El Fausto was being towed, it suddenly lurched forward and went bow down into the water and sunk so rapidly that it ripped the tow line off of the back of the Ana de Mayo and was underwater well before they could do anything to try to stop it. The crew of the Ana de Mayo swore they had followed procedure and they knew what they were doing and this was just kind of a freak thing, but regardless of how or why it happened, the ship was now gone and so too was the dead bodies. They couldn't even positively identify whoever that was. All they had was that notebook they recovered from inside the engine room. The notebook was sent to La Palma where it was put in front of the families of the four men who were on El Fausto and very quickly Julio's wife was able to identify his handwriting. He apparently had a unique way of writing and she was used to reading it and so she said, that's definitely his writing. And in fact, I recognize that notebook. He kept that notebook to track payments because he was a mechanic and people requested his services and that's what he used to track payments. This of course meant the dead man inside of the engine room was almost certainly Julio. Julio's wife examined the notebook and she was able to decipher that last page, at least most of it, and she said it was this very detailed description of exactly what she needed to do once he died, because clearly, based on the way he was writing, he knew he was about to die. And at first it says, 
you know, here's how you access my insurance policy and here are the different properties I own and how you go about selling them. And then in his final moments, he scrawled one last message at the very bottom of the last page that said, don't ever tell our son all that has happened to me. You know that God wanted this fate for me. Love you. So if Julio was so sure he was about to die that he would take the time to write out a detailed list of instructions for his wife to follow when he died, well then why didn't he take the time to also offer a small explanation as to what happened to he and the other crew members of El Fausto? He had to have known that whoever was going to find his dead body in this notebook was gonna have an awful lot of questions. Unless he did know that and did write a description, except it was in those 28 pages in the middle of the notebook that had been removed. And if that's the case, then who removed them and why? And where's the rest of the El Fausto crew? And why did they tell the Duquesa that nothing was wrong with their ship? And why didn't they take the tow into shore, which would have guaranteed their safety? There's just so many questions that have never been answered in 50 years. The most widely accepted theory is the crew of El Fausto experienced a series of small but compounding setbacks that combined with panic led to really bad decision making and ultimately their death. Others say there are just too many anomalies and oddities about this case to just be a product of bad decision making, that there has to be something else going on. And so there are lots of alternative theories about what happened, ranging from abduction to illegal trafficking gone wrong, to perhaps they saw something they shouldn't have. But sadly, no one will know for sure what happened to these guys until there is a major break in the case. And at this point, people are just hoping those missing 28 pages turn up and that those will be able to explain what happened to El Fausto and her crew. So that's gonna do it, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's story. If you found today's secret in the video, tell us in the comments what it is and where it's located. Give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, the next time you're over at the Like Button's house, sneak upstairs and steal all of their left socks and also unplug their Wi-Fi. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.